everyone, welcome to the Westwood Public Library. I'm Corinne, I'm one of the reference librarians here at the library. And I'm just gonna do a quick intro and then I'm gonna pass it over to our star of the evening. So allow me to introduce Dr. Stephen Knott, who is a professor of National Security Affairs at the United States Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. He's the author of 10 books dealing with the American presidency, the early republic, and American foreign policy. Tonight, Steve will be discussing his new book, Coming to Terms with John F. Kennedy, a nuanced assessment of the 35th president. Unfortunately, while the library has ordered a copy of the book, it hasn't come in quite yet, or else I'd be like holding it up here for you. Um, if you would like to request it though for when it comes in, just let us know and we'll be happy to get you on the list for it. And I just want to give a quick thank you to all the friends of the Westwood Public Library for all they do to support all of our programs here for all ages. So that's it. I'm going to pass it over to Stephen Knott. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I particularly want to thank my sister-in-law, Patty Wade, of the Westwood Public Library for also making this evening's event uh, happen. And um, thank all of you for coming out tonight to listen to this talk. Uh, let me begin by noting that I have sort of grappled or wrestled with John F. Kennedy's legacy all my life. And uh, I've been thinking about writing this book for literally for decades. Uh, and I began this project hoping to find the real President Kennedy, not the one that I worshiped in my youth. I grew up in a very, very rock solid New Deal, New Frontier, Massachusetts family. Uh, but I kind of drifted away for that, from that for a time, for quite some time, actually. Uh, and so I hoped in this book to find a kind of middle ground between that worshipful Kennedy that I uh, looked up to in my youth and uh, uh, the, you know, th there was a time when I began to think that he really wasn't more than an empty suit, kind of superficial qualities, good looks, TV friendly, et cetera. I was hoping to find a more realistic assessment. I think I've achieved that goal, but you guys will be the judge. Uh, John F. Kennedy is the first person I remember, uh, the, excuse me, the first president I remember. Uh, and my life was tangentially, but in an odd way, firmly connected to his legacy. My first memory as a human being is of the Cuban Missile Crisis. My brother and I were wrestling on the floor in front of a grainy black and white television. Uh, and there was this man on that grainy TV speaking and my parents were sort of glued to that TV. And they actually asked my brother and I to sort of cool it a bit so they could hear what he was saying. And it became clear to me that they were very concerned about what this person was saying. I'm not sure I even knew or realized it was President Kennedy. Uh, I was five years old at the time. But when my brother came home from school the next day, he's three years older than I was, um, all the kids at school had been talking about the possibility of war. And at that point, it really registered. Uh, shortly after that, my father came home with plans, uh, blueprints for a bomb shelter that they, he was gonna build in our backyard, which I thought was the coolest thing ever, but I don't think my parents considered it that. Um, I should also mention that my mother, who was Irish Catholic, worshipped President Kennedy, and I use that term uh, intently. Um, she uh, was Irish Catholic, as I said. She had fought to create the first Catholic church in this small town in Worcester County that I grew up in, Paxton, Mass. Um, and it was a kind of an ugly battle. There was resistance on the part of some of the older residents who were Protestants uh, to erecting this church. And there were scars from that battle that she never forgot. This would have been around 1948, 49. Uh, and so when President Kennedy broke that glass ceiling uh, that kept Irish Catholics, Catholics out of the White House, uh, he could do no wrong in my mother's mind. And so that's the atmosphere that I grew up with in. Uh, she used to ask me, I, I've written a book or two about Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush, uh, 
And she would frequently say to me, when are you going to write a book about a good president like John F. Kennedy? <laughs> so I finally delivered on that promise. I should note that there are over 40,000 books on President Kennedy, which is kind of amazing considering that he was only president for two years, 10 months and two days. Um, of those 40,000 books, a substantial portion of those titles are focused on the assassination. But nonetheless, uh, a remarkable amount of uh, literature written about this president, who was, again, uh, was president for a very brief period of time. But again, I do believe this book sort of benefits from the passage of 60 years. In fact, this week, 60 years ago, is when we all, if you were around then, would have been concerned about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, yesterday, 60 years ago, yesterday, President Kennedy was told that the Soviet Union, despite repeated assurances, was placing uh, nuclear weapons in Cuba that were capable of hitting the United States within a matter of minutes. And despite their repeated assurances that they weren't doing that, they were doing it, and President Kennedy found out about that 60 years ago yesterday. So again, despite the existence of all these titles, I believe I have something new to say about this brief but important presidency. And what I want to talk to you tonight about is three issues as to why I think Kennedy's presidency mattered and mattered deeply. Uh, the first is President Kennedy and the religious issue. He used to refer to it as that religious thing uh, that he really had to overcome in the 60 campaign. The second is John F. Kennedy and civil rights. And the third is John F. Kennedy and the race to the moon. So those are the three areas I'll focus on tonight. But when we start asking, when we get to the questions, I'm happy to talk about any issue you wish. So let's start off with this religious thing, as Kennedy called it. John F. Kennedy was a man of great charm, no question. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats routinely said that about him. But there was one issue that he could not charm his way out of, and that was his Catholic faith. No Catholic had ever been elected President of the United States. And in fact, in 1928, the Democratic Party nominated, the first of any major party to nominate a Catholic, a candidate named Al Smith, who was the governor of New York. And Smith's religion, his Catholic faith, cost him that election, no question. So states that had formally voted down the line, Democrat voted for Herbert Hoover instead. And so the Democratic Party had been scarred by that 1928 experience. And uh, in 1960, it remained very much an issue. The fear was, among many Americans, mostly Protestant Americans, that Kennedy would place the interests of the Vatican ahead of that of the United States. And just to give you an example of that kind of thinking, uh, there was a prominent uh, Protestant clergyman by the name of Norman Vincent Peale. Some of you may remember that name. He was the author of a best-selling book called The Power of Positive Thinking. Uh, but Norman Vincent Peale had nothing positive to say about the prospect of a Catholic president. This is a direct quote from Peale, quote, faced with the election of a Catholic, our culture is at stake. In other words, for Peale, the entire American culture was on the ballot in 1960, and the election of a Catholic would mark the end of the United States as it had existed up until that point. By the way, it's important to note that the culture wars that we are in the midst of today, there's nothing new about them. Uh, the Reverend Billy Graham, a name I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with, also joined in the effort to stop Kennedy. Uh, he kept Richard Nixon apprised of his efforts throughout the fall campaign in 1960. Graham opted to do this, uh, his anti-Kennedy work, quietly, uh, because Norman Vincent Peale had gone public with his opposition to Kennedy on religious grounds and had been uh, skewered by many folks in the media. So Graham decided to work, as I said, covertly, and he told Richard Nixon privately, I intend to do all in my power to help you get elected. So rumors swirled throughout the, the Bible Belt that if Kennedy were elected, he would hang rosary beads made from bowling balls from the Statue of Liberty. 
I mean, some of this stuff is totally off the wall, but nevertheless, some of what we hear today is totally off the wall, uh, and would install a hotline between the White House and the Vatican. Uh, author Sean Casey, he's focused on Kennedy's Catholicism and the 60 campaign, observed that the argument of Peel and Billy Graham and countless other Protestant clergymen was that, quote, if Kennedy was elected, he'd criminalize birth control, he'd cut off foreign aid that helped countries invest in birth control, and he'd funny, funnel tax money to Catholic parochial school. Interesting to note today, by the way, that uh, that would make him popular with some Protestant theologians today. Now, Kennedy had never advocated any of those positions, uh, but the fact was that this was assumed. It was simply assumed that a Catholic candidate would put the Vatican, would put his faith first, and his country second. And I think it is important to note that one of the deepest prejudices in American history, obviously I'd put race first, uh, but a close second, perhaps, is this bias towards Catholicism and this notion that Catholics could not be loyal Americans. And it's also interesting to note that part of the objections to John F. Kennedy in 1960 not only came from cons somewhat conservative Protestant clergymen, it also came from American liberals. Uh, there were a lot of folks, and I would even put perhaps Eleanor Roosevelt in this category. Uh, she was not a big fan of John F. Kennedy, and I think part of that, small part perhaps, was this fear of Kennedy's Catholicism. Uh, some liberals, John F. Kennedy was told by one of his advisors, are secret anti-Catholics. So Kennedy decided, and this was kind of a master stroke, and it was high risk, he decided to speak to a group in Houston, Texas, uh, the Greater Houston Ministerial Association, about two months prior to his election in 1960. And again, I want to emphasize how risky this was. Both his vice presidential nominee, Lyndon Johnson, and the Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn, both from Texas, urged Kennedy not to appear before the Houston Ministers Association. Kennedy rejected their advice rolled the dice, and gave a very spirited address. You can see this on YouTube. Uh, it's an address, by the way, that traditional Catholics to this day object to. Uh, but what he makes the case for is a kind of high wall of separation between church and state. Uh, he argues that nobody asked him what his faith was when he almost lost his life in the South Pacific in 1943. Um, and he, he, he just explicitly rejects the allegation that he would obey the Pope and not the Constitution of the United States. Let me just give you one quick quote from that speech. Quote, contrary to common newspaper usage, I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party's candidate for president who happens, <coughs> excuse me, also to be a Catholic. I do not speak for my church on public matters and the church does not speak for me. And again, it's important to note here that Kennedy used television to great effect to amplify this message. So his address to the Houston ministers was broadcast throughout the entire state of Texas, live, by 19 local TV stations. And his own campaign recorded this address. They taped it, and they produced a one half hour um, uh, they produced a half hour segment devoted to highlights from the speech and then one and five minute advertisements that were used throughout the United States, particularly in urban areas where there was a heavy Catholic vote. And so um, there are disputes to this day. Some historians say that Kennedy's Catholicism was a net plus because a lot of urban voters of Catholic faith really got out and voted for him. Uh, while he may have paid a price for that, of course, in the more Protestant, perhaps rural areas. Last thing I'll say about Kennedy and Catholicism, the hostility to him does not subside after he wins that election. And I've got a quote here from Billy Graham's father-in-law, very prominent theologian, Protestant theologian named L. Nelson Bell. Uh, 
And Bell wrote to Nixon after Kennedy's victory, quote, claiming that Kennedy's victory was comparable to the death of a loved one, the loved one being the United States, and the United States was in the process of dying. And Kennedy, uh, Bell argued, was at the head of a completely integrated and planned attempt, so in other words, a conspiracy, uh, to allow for, quote, the takeover of our nation for the Roman Catholic Church. And Bell added, you, Dick, Dick Nixon, stood for things which have made America great, while Mr. Kennedy appealed to the most venal elements in American society. So again, Kennedy's victory in 1960 shattered that glass ceiling that kept the Catholic out of the White House. It is interesting to note that it would be another 60 years before the nation elected another Catholic president in 2020. All right, let me shift gears here and talk about President Kennedy and civil rights. And this is a very controversial issue. What I'm about to say is a view that's perhaps not shared by a majority of historians or political scientists who look at this period. So with that disclaimer in mind, I'm going to proceed ahead. Uh, from the perspective of Martin Luther King, uh, Andrew Young, John Lewis, uh, other activists who marched for civil rights and really literally put their lives on the line, John F. Kennedy's evolution on civil rights was slow in coming. Um, they had every reason, I completely understand it, to question Kennedy's belated commitment to equal justice under the law. Um, so again, that's something of a disclaimer here. I would argue, however, that Kennedy um, finally, belatedly, took significant risks, risks on behalf of the civil rights movement. Uh, he could have thrown the weight of his office behind that movement earlier than he did. But keep in mind, he had just squeaked into the White House in 1960. It was one of the closest elections in American history. And part of the reason Kennedy won in 1960 is some of the so-called Solid South, which at that time voted routinely Democratic, had supported him. And so, for instance, the state of Georgia gave him, one of his, gave him his highest margin of victory, even higher than Massachusetts believe it or not. So from Kennedy's perspective, for him to win re-election in 1964, the path to that re-election went through the South again. And adding to that is the fact that Congress at that time was controlled by powerful Southern Democrat committee chairs who had been there for decades. And they had made it clear to Kennedy that if he wanted any of his agenda, domestic or foreign, uh, he would have to kowtow to them, in a sense. So there was a political calculation made early on that led Kennedy to be quite cautious in terms of his approach to civil rights. Um, comparisons are going to be made after he's killed between John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln. And I'm not up here making that comparison at all. But I would say perhaps there's one point of similarity in that both were accused at the time of moving cautiously, too slowly, of putting the, putting the interests of the white majority over this aggrieved minority. And I think that's accurate. Uh, but I would also say perhaps with some justification, both of those presidents had to make a political calculation. And I think both decided to allow events, Lincoln's case, progress or lack thereof of the Civil War, in Kennedy's case, the increasingly violent response to the Civil Rights Movement, which he began to see was starting to alter white public opinion, at least in the North. And so, again, did he put himself out front on this issue, making it a moral Quest, absolutely not. Not until his last year in office. And in June of 1963, June 11th to be exact, Kennedy delivers what I believe is one of the most impressive speeches ever made by an American president. It's worth watching. You can see it on YouTube. It's 10 or 12 minutes long. In which he stakes his presidency. 
on the passage of what will become the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But more importantly, he argues for the Civil Rights Act of 64 on moral grounds. And this was almost unheard of in the history of the American presidency, certainly unheard of in the Democratic Party, which up until Franklin Roosevelt was dominated by segregationists. Let me just quickly, if you will, just read a few of the lines from that speech from June of 63. And by the way, Kennedy decided at the last minute to deliver this speech. There had been a series of violent encounters between civil rights demonstrators and segregationists, Ku Klux Klan members, et cetera, white citizens council members who were basically Klansmen throughout the South. And finally, on June 11th, he decided to go with this speech. And they were writing this speech up until the last minute that he went on the air. And he actually improvised some of the lines in the speech. Uh, and it's a remarkably moving speech. Quote, and this is directly from the president, the heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. Whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for public officials who were represented, in short, if he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? That was the standard line. Not now, we gotta wait. It's too soon, too quick. And then he added, we face a moral crisis as a country and as a people. It is time to act in the Congress, in your state and local legislative bodies, and above all, in our daily lives. Those who do nothing are inviting shame as well as violence. Those who act boldly are recognizing right as well as reality. Uh, again, I strongly recommend this speech to, uh, for you to, to, to take a look at it. And if you consider, literally, as he's sitting at that desk, they're still handing him pages of the speech. Um, again, another example of Kennedy's ability to use television as a powerful medium. So what I, would, I would argue that while Kennedy was somewhat belated in terms of his embrace of civil rights, he did embrace it within three to four months of his death, and his invocation of both Scripture and the American Constitution, in terms of arguing for equal justice, uh, was a remarkable appeal in the history of this nation and in the history of, of the presidency. In my book, I argue that this one particular day was the high, high water mark of the Kennedy's, uh, of Kennedy's presidency. One last thing. When Kennedy made this speech, his poll numbers began to tank and in particular in the South. He was starting to lose, just as I said before, the support of white Southern Democrats who saw this speech as an endorsement of Martin Luther King and his movement, which in a sense it was. And part of the reason John F. Kennedy is in Texas in November 1963 is Texas was now in play for 1964. And he's going down there to try to shore up this critical state where his own vice president is from um, and getting ready for the 64 election. I do think had John F. Kennedy lived, had he not been killed on November 22nd, 1963, that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 would have passed. Some historians would differ, just to let you know that. They assume it was all Linda Johnson's legislative skill and the martyrdom of President Kennedy. No doubt that contributed to the relative ease of passing the 64 bill. So I think Kennedy's bill would have been perhaps a bit narrower. The vote might have been somewhat tighter. But he was putting, risking his entire presidency, his entire domestic legislative initiative on that bill. And I think ultimately he would have squeaked it out. The final uh, issue 
or events from the Kennedy presidency to make the case that this presidency, this brief presidency mattered, is JFK and the race for the moon, race to the moon. Kennedy's commitment to landing a man on the moon before the end of the 1960s stands taller with each passing decade. This is a remarkable scientific, uh, technological engineering achievement using primitive technology. I'm told that each of us has more computer power in our automobiles than the space program did going to the moon in 1969, okay? So a lot of the calculations were still being done by hand, all right? Uh, when Kennedy committed the United States in 1962, both in a State of the Union address and at a speech at Rice University in September of 62, to landing a man on the moon before this decade was out, uh, he was committing this country to something that we lacked the ability to do at that time. This was not a safe bet. This was a, another roll of the dice that could have easily gone sideways. And it's important to note the opposition to Kennedy's goal of putting a man, a man on the moon by the end of the decade, the opposition in the Republican Party was extensive. They thought this was a waste of money. And one of the leading critics of the space pro program of the manned mission to the moon was former President Dwight Eisenhower who described the effort as, quote, nuts, end quote. Um, I admire Eisenhower. There's a lot about President Eisenhower. Obviously, there's a general and a president to admire. But this is where you see, I think, a startling difference between one of our oldest presidents, Eisenhower, and one of our youngest, Kennedy. Eisenhower was literally a child of the 1800s. Kennedy was the first president born in the 20th century. Kennedy had more faith, I think, in America's scientific ability uh, than Eisenhower, who again was a child of a previous century. But I do think, particularly in this, on this issue, Kennedy stands taller than Eisenhower in terms of setting this goal. Kennedy packaged the race to the moon on two levels. One, it was part of his new frontier. That was the tagline for his administration. The other was that it was part of our anti-communist agenda. We were going to beat the Russians to the moon. They had beaten us into space with the launch of Sputnik, the satellite, in 1957. We were playing catch up to the Russians throughout the late 50s and early 60s. For Kennedy, this was a symbol of shame. This was failure. And he wanted us to beat the Soviet Union to the moon, thinking that that would reverberate around the globe and demonstrate the superiority of our system. Um, and has, as he noted in, an, in that State of the Union message that I alluded to a few minutes ago, he played on this theme that Americans love exploration, that Americans have always wanted to explore a new frontier, whether it was moving across the Mississippi and across the Great Plains, heading out to Hawaii and Alaska. Now what was left is the moon and the planets. And so he appeals to this American sense of adventure, and he appeals to this kind of anti-communism that was very much in the air at the time. Uh, some of us here tonight are baby, baby boomers. I'm sure we can recall the excitement, not only of the moon landing itself, but of the various space missions and space, space walks carried out by those with the right stuff. You know, Neil Armstrong, Alan Shepard, John Glenn, Gus Grissom, Wally Sherrar. These were household names in the 60s. And we would all be packed into the school auditoriums, again, in front of a grainy black and white television to watch the latest space achievement. And of course, these astronauts became heroes. Uh, Life magazine, Look magazine, etc., which also helped craft John F. Kennedy's image, made heroes out of Glenn, Shepard, Armstrong, etc. One um, comment from the time that sort of sums up the American attitude towards the space program and a kind of contempt for the Russians 
I love this quote, it's, it's in my book. Quote, talking about the Russians, these people couldn't build a refrigerator. How can they get into orbit? <laughs> we just didn't get it. We just didn't understand it. And um, Kennedy sort of exploited that sentiment, I think for, for relatively positive re uh, reasons. So it was John F. Kennedy more than any other American who made the moon landing a reality. He did so in the face of concerted opposition from primarily from the opposition party. But again, I think he understood the powerful appeal of adventure, of the insatiable thirst for heroes, and of anti-communism. All right, let me conclude, and I really will hope to get to some questions from all of you. We could talk about anything well beyond what I've mentioned here. Uh, but after living, in a sense, with the Kennedy presidency for over six decades, I've come to the conclusion that this is a president who des deserves more than a second look, and I would argue, in fact, that he deserves the status of a near great president. And I can explain later why I put him in the near great category, not great. Uh, Kennedy challenged the American people, sometimes belatedly, on civil rights, but asking them to deliver on the nation's promise. I think he appealed to the better angels of the American people, urging them to devote themselves to something higher. And the Peace Corps, for instance, I think is one of the primary examples of his call for service be before self. Uh, and of course, in his inaugural address, he made the famous line about ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So Kennedy, uh, I would add to the list of the reason why I think he was near great. He was not all that far removed from his immig immigrant forebears who came to Boston, came to the United States because they considered it, as Lincoln put it, the last best hope of mankind. I think Kennedy encapsulated this spirit both for his fellow citizens and for those watching from abroad to this day. Kennedy remains a remarkably popular figure overseas. Now in his personal conduct, he fell far short of uh, living up to the best, far short. Uh, but so, so have American presidents such as Thomas Jefferson, uh, who I would argue, even though I'm a good Hamiltonian, Jefferson, Jefferson's aspirations for the nation point the way for all of us. And I would argue John F. Kennedy, for that reason and others, uh, his place in the American mind should be secured. Thank you. So let's open it up. Again, whatever, you, whatever you'd like to talk about, there's a lot of foreign policy issues I didn't even touch on. Yeah. I have a question, um, because regarding his personal life and, and some of those things, at what point did those come up? Were they coming out in prison or while he was president, or was that kind of a after his death, sort of smear campaign, or just uh, um, attempting to put that out there and say, hey, this guy wasn't what you think yeah. he was? So, at the time of his death, there would have been a few folks in Washington, D.C., maybe even a couple of reporters, who would have known that this, this guy was not, you know, husband of the year. Um, but in media circles at, at that time, there was kind of a high wall of separation between what they considered personal and what they considered private. The stuff we all know today about John F. Kennedy really doesn't emerge until almost, I can almost give you the exact year. It's around 1975 when the Senate conducted an investigation of assassination plots that the United States had hatched against people like Fidel Castro in Cuba. And that was a program that took place under Kennedy and under Eisenhower. Uh, the code name for it was Operation Mongoose. They were going to bring down the Castro regime with whatever it took, including taking him out if need be. And the Central Intelligence Agency had turned to American organized crime to help make that happen. In the course of that investigation, it was discovered that one of the key mob bosses involved in that effort, a guy by the name of Sam Giancana, who controlled the Chicago mob, uh, was uh, sleeping with a woman who was also sleeping with the president. And the investigation 
um, was chaired by Democrats, many of whom knew Kennedy. Senator Frank Church was the chair of the committee. They, they were trying to figure out how best to reveal this. In a way, it wasn't part of the focus of the investigation, but nonetheless, when you come across something like that, you can't, you can't bury that. And so I think in a footnote in their final report, they mention a woman who was involved with both the president and this mob boss at the same time. That was kind of earth shattering. And that was 1975. And then since then, there have been quite a few other uh, revelations. Um, so that took a little bit of the shine off. It certainly took a shine off the whole Camelot uh, myth. Now, by the way, it's quite clear that Mrs. Kennedy knew all this stuff was going on. You know, the damage it did to her, I'm sure, is incalculable. We'll never know. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I know there's material in the Kennedy Library that probably when all of us are gone, it will show how much she knew and how much it hurt her. Um, but um, yeah, it's about 12 to 13 years after he's killed that this stuff comes pouring out. Uh, Kennedy loyalists at the time, of course, denied it, but it's definitely true. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have uh, uh, two, two topics, two questions. Uh, one is how do you think, uh, had Kennedy lived in Vietnam, yeah. would have uh, changed and different? Yeah, great question. So Kennedy in Vietnam, I have an entire chapter of the, on that in the book. This is one area where I've done a complete 180. I used to be very much a part of the school that Kennedy would have followed the same course of action as Johnson, his vice president, did in Vietnam. Now I completely disagree with that assessment. And the ba and so look, this is conjecture. We'll, we'll never know for sure, that disclaimer up front. But I do think some conjecture is based more in fact than others. This is a president who hated war. This is a president who could have easily been killed in August of 1943. Two of his crew members were killed immediately when their PT boat was hit by a Japanese destroyer. One of his crew members was grotesquely burned. Was, uh, you know, the, the boat was literally cut in half by a much larger ship. Explosions everywhere, death, serious wounds. Kennedy saves the life of this badly burned crew member by swimming with this guy on his back for a remarkable distance. I know something I, no way I could have done, even at, you know, in my 20s, which is what he was at this time. But the point is, his letters home before and during and after the PT-109 incident are filled with anti-war sentiment. These are private letters to his parents or brothers and sisters. He hated war. And he talked about a crew member of his who was one of the two killed immediately. This was a guy in the front turret of this PT boat who was instantly killed when it was hit. A young kid who was married and had two or three children. And this kid had told Kennedy, his skipper, that he expected to die in this war, and he did. And Kennedy writes to his parents saying, I should have transferred him. I should have tried harder to get him off this boat, but he refused. This kid wanted to stay on the boat. So he had this premonition that he would die, and he died. This is 1943. This is within 20 years of him becoming president. You don't forget stuff like that. So when he's sitting in the White House in 1961, 62, 63, and we're on the edge of nuclear war, especially 60 years ago this week, a lot of folks on the inside thought the end was near. And it could have gone that way. He is doing everything he can to avoid World War III, to avoid a nuclear exchange. He talks about his own kids one of whom is uh, five or six, the other one is barely three. And he talks about all the children who could get incinerated. We're talking about millions of casualties. Um, he remember, uh, uh, I'm a little bit of conjecture here because there's nothing on the record saying he referred to his people, but he hated war. That is a consistent thread throughout his career. 
Now, what makes it complicated is because the Cold War was such a powerful political uh, motivator at the time. I mean, for a Democrat to win the White House and to take an anti-war stance, it's not going to happen. You don't win. So in 1960, he sort of out hawks Richard Nixon. He takes a tougher national security stand against Nixon. But underneath it all, this is a guy desperate to find a way out of this mutual assured destruction that the Soviet Union and the United States used to keep each other in check. He hated it. And so there's a definite trend within his presence in the missile crisis itself. He makes concessions to Khrushchev that probably would have gotten him impeached had they been known at the time. So there is no way, in my view, that this is a man by 1967 or 68 that is going to say we need 550,000 American troops in Vietnam and the body bags are coming back in some weeks by the hundreds. There's no way in hell he's going to go down that same path. I'm convinced of this. And one of the tragedies, there's a tragedy on so many levels with Dallas, is, in my view, Vietnam. Now, again, I've, I've switched 180 degrees on that, and I owe. I owe uh, a scholar by the name of Sheldon Stern, who used to be the historian at the Kennedy Library, whom I knew it. Stern's the one who found these anti-war letters. Um, and you cannot read those things and assume that this is a guy who would have, as I said, sat by while thousands of Americans were killed. It just, it's contrary to everything he stood for. Great question, though. Thank you. Joe. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the influence that Bobby had yeah. uh, John, and maybe start with uh, the equal rights? Uh, because what I've read and, and seen of you know, Bobby and speeches is that you know, he seemed to believe in equal rights with like every fiber of his being. Yeah. And it wasn't political, it was something that he truly you know, believed in. Yeah. Maybe start there. Sure. I'm sure he had significant so he, point, he appoints his brother as the Attorney General. There's, of course, a civil rights division in the Department of Justice that had just been created under President Eisenhower. Robert Kennedy devotes a lot of attention to civil rights. But I would say, Joe, even Bobby Kennedy at the beginning, having been JFK's campaign manager, he knows how important the Democrats are, the Southern Democrats are, for 1964 and for the legislative agenda. So he's cautious as well. And in fact, there was a real heated confrontation between Attorney General Kennedy and a group of black uh, civil rights activists in New York City sometime in 1961. And they rip into him for his caution. You know, we've got people on buses on these freedom rides. They're being killed. And you guys are doing shit. I mean, it was, it was ugly. It was tense. Robert Kennedy was offended by the tone of it at that time. He later came to see that you know, they had reason to, to be that passionate and that emotional about it. And I do think he embraces the cause of civil rights ahead of his brother, in a sense. And he actually travels, of all places, to the University of Georgia in 1961 and makes a very strong speech in favor of equal rights. Uh, and the security that night was quite tight. Uh, because there were death threats directed against Robert Kennedy over his civil rights stance. By 1962, 63, both brothers are starting to be put off, needless to say, by the attacks on the Freedom Riders, by the riot that occurs at the University of Mississippi in late September 1962, just a few weeks before the missile crisis, when one black veteran by the name of James Met Meredith, tries to register at Old Miss, and the governor of state threatens to shut the entire school down. And you get three, hour, excuse me, three days worth of violent protests by Klansmen, by white citizen council members from all over the South. This is their rallying. They're going to make a stand here at Old Miss. And Kennedy and Robert, both the president and the attorney general try to negotiate with the Democrat governor of Mississippi, Ross Barnett, 
who supported them in 1960, to just let this one guy in, even if you let him through the back door, just, you know, what the hell? They, they couldn't wrap their arms around it. And he refuses. And so Kennedy eventually has to nationalize the Mississippi National Guard. He has to send in four or 500 US Marshals who are pelted with rocks, bottles. Two people are killed, all over the admission of one black student who's a veteran. They ultimately succeed in getting him admitted. Uh, but again, the cost to both Bobby Kennedy and Jack Kennedy in the South is it's starting to register. This guy is not a friend of, this president is not a friend of ours. Fast forward to spring of 63, Governor George Wallace stands in the doorway at the University of Alabama and tries to prevent two black students, James Hood and uh, Vivian Malone, from registering at the University of Alabama. Another showdown with another Democratic governor. All of these events, uh, the murder of James Meredith, uh, on the very night that Kennedy delivers that civil rights speech that I mentioned to you in June of 63, all of that pushes both of them to embrace civil rights. Now, in August of 63 is when King delivers his I Have a Dream speech. And it is absolutely true that both Bobby and Jack Kennedy were very concerned about the optics of that, of hundreds of thousands of African Americans from around the country protesting for civil rights. What if it spiraled out of control? What would the reaction be on Capitol Hill? So they were not particularly keen on that march. But after King delivers his speech, Kennedy invites King and the key civil rights leaders into the Oval Office, congratulates them on their efforts, and again, in the last months of his, li of his life, he is, I would argue, completely identified with that civil rights movement. Um, so there's an evolution. One point I try to make in my book, Joe, is I think there's a tendency to give Robert Kennedy more credit than he, he deserves some credit for sure, but the argument that he kind of forced his reluctant brother to go along with him, I think, is, is fiction put out by a lot of Robert Kennedy's supporters? Great question. Uh, sir, you had your hand up. Um, uh, I, I, as you mentioned earlier, there's been perhaps thousands of books written about the assassination. And uh, I just wonder where you come down on that in terms of. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I come down quite clearly that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. And this will probably be one of the most to the extent that people read it, this chapter might be the least popular chapter of all because there's a burgeoning conspiracy, assassination conspiracy complex out there and they don't like to be challenged. Uh, and they can always find some thread to pull that raises questions and there are questions to be raised, no doubt. So the Warren Commission that investigates Kennedy's assassination concludes that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. And I think they got it right. Unfortunately, the Warren Commission withheld certain materials on somewhat legitimate grounds. They didn't talk about Operation Mongoose. They didn't talk at all about our efforts to kill Castro. So that was just off limits, because it was still a classified program. The committee members would have known about it. Most of them would have, I think probably all of them knew about it. But that part is left out. When we find out, when the American public finds out in 1975, the year when we find out about his, Kennedy's personal life, um, the floodgates open. Well, we were trying to kill Castro, they got to Kennedy first. Or, um, the kind of people like Sam Giancana that the CIA contracted with to kill Castro got pissed off at what they saw as Kennedy's um, fecklessness, somewhat hesitant approach to Cuba. So they took the president out. They took our president out so they could get a more hardline take on Castro. I mean, endless, endless, endless theories. The fact is, when John F. Kennedy was shot in Dealey Plaza in Texas, if you watch some of the video and the still photos taken, everybody immediately surges towards this grassy knoll. Let's say the car is facing this way. 
grassy knoll would have been about there. They all assumed the shots had come from behind a fence on top of this little hill because the sound was echoing. It's actually a relatively small square. The sound was echoing all over Kingdom, Kingdom Come, and it was bouncing off that fence, and people assumed that's where. So you see police officers, you see the crowd streaming up that hill to find the assassin. But the evidence against Lee Harvey Oswald is somewhat circumstantial, but I would argue overwhelming. Oswald had tried to kill a retired American general in April of 63. Took a shot at him at his home in Dallas. He missed. But that gun that was fired in April of 63 is the same gun that kills President Kennedy. It's Oswald's gun. Friday, November 22, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald is given a ride to work by a co-worker, and he has a large wrapped up um, package with him. The guy with him says, what, what's that stuff? Oswald says, curtain rods. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't bring curtain rods to work, okay? <laughs> when the shots occur, um, there's one employee, one, from the Texas School Book Depository who flees the building, Lee Harvey Oswald. Everybody else stays put. He leaves. Within, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, Seven to, well, several witnesses see him shoot and kill a Dallas police officer who pulled him aside because he kind of fit a description of this missing man from the book depository. He kills this police officer, runs into a movie theater, they capture him there. There's no question that Oswald killed this police officer, none. Um, there's a palm print found on this rifle that Oswald had ordered through the mails. It's his palm print. There are empty shell casings on the sixth floor of the school book depository where the sniper had built a little, uh, he piled up, it's a book warehouse, he piled up a bunch of boxes and sheltered himself behind it. Three co-workers right below him on the fifth floor said the shots came from right above them. They could even hear the shell casings hitting the floor. The building shook so much, one of the guys said the plaster was falling on his head. I mean, the, a couple of witnesses in the plaza itself, they see people running to the grassy knoll, and they say, no, I saw a guy with a rifle on that sixth floor. Now, one of the witnesses was black, which I think is part of the reason the Dallas police at first went, well, who knows if he knows what he's talking about. But it, it, it's just, it's overwhelming. Oswald had delusions of grandeur. He, he was 24 years old, just turned 24. He wanted to make a name for himself. He kept a diary that he called his historic diary. He's one of these, sad to say, I'm trying to find a word better than loser. Um, loser from the underside of American history uh, that wants to make a name for himself, and he succeeded big time. One of the few sort of revelations in my book is a year earlier, October 62, in the midst of the missile crisis, Kennedy travels to Springfield, Illinois to, of all things, lay a wreath at Abraham Lincoln's tomb. And a gun appears from a window, kind of a main street like this, um, with a scope on it, open limousine, easy target. The person decides, thank God, not to pull the trigger, because imagine the president being killed in the midst of the missile crisis. Who are you going to suspect? Well, of course you're going to suspect the Soviets or their lackeys. Um, no changes are made by the Secret Service. Uh, I'm very critical of the Secret Service in this book. Now, in fairness to them, President Kennedy did not like a lot of tight security. It was his people that didn't want to put this protective bubble on the limousine. Um, but, you know, after that event in Springfield, you would have thought something would have changed, and nothing changed. Quite a few members of that Secret Service detail were out until the sun came up um, in Dallas. You know, 
drinking away. They were not in great shape, most of them. So their performance was horrific. That, that too has been kind of papered over, sadly. But again, in my view, Oswald did it. And I, I don't see him, he would have liked to have been part of a larger conspiracy, but I, I don't see him. He was such a nut, even the Cuban, he, he actually visited the Cuban embassy in Mexico City within a month or two of Kennedy's murder. And apparently even they thought he was crazy. So they sent him packing. Um, but again, he's one of these young guys who wants to make a name for himself today. He probably would, well, I won't go down that path. Kath. Um, I remember at one point you were among a group of historians that were asked to rank the presidents, one yeah. through 46. Do you remember where you put Kennedy? Yeah, I put him uh, quite high. I, so C-SPAN every four years does polls like 150 historians and political scientists to rank the president. It's always Washington and Lincoln who come, usually Lincoln first, Washington second, FDR, Jefferson, Eisenhower does quite well. I, I had Kennedy uh, down around 10, somewhere in there. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't rank him too high again because it was such a brief presidency, although in that brief period of time, so many important things happened. But for me, he's a near great president. Um, part of the classification for me for near great is because I, I would like to say his personal conduct was just his personal conduct, but some of it wasn't. I mean, when you're sleeping with the same woman who's sleeping with the Chicago mob boss and your president and your brother's trying to prosecute this guy, it's, it's not a good look, to say the least. So I'd like to say there was a high wall of separation between the personal and private, but he really blurred it. And I should mention, John and Robert Kennedy, if they had their way, they would have gotten rid of J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, who should have been gotten rid of, peacefully, not, you know. Um, and they knew he had, he had the goods on them, uh, on the president. That, that was at least in the back of their minds. They couldn't touch this guy because he knew too much. So again, the personal bled over into the public. Yeah. Good. Yes, ma'am. I just wondered your thoughts on the Bay of Pigs. Yeah. Yeah, so the Bay of Pigs is April 1961. It's considered to be probably one of Kennedy's worst foreign policy fiascos. That's the word you always hear. He had, Kennedy had campaigned in 1960, accusing Eisenhower and Vice President Nixon of being asleep at the switch while Cuba went communist, and he vowed to do something about it. This was part of his effort to get the United States to move beyond the lethargy of the Eisenhower years. They were beating us in space, Look at what they've done. They've got a foothold in the Caribbean, 90 miles from Key West. This is intolerable. We can't let it stand. Kennedy inherits a plan from Eisenhower uh, to arm and equip Cuban exiles who had been forced out of Cuba when Castro came to power, mostly middle class and upper middle class Cubans who lost property and businesses, and et cetera, although some were lower class and simply just thought one tyranny had been exchanged for another. They wanted Castro gone. So we take this group of Cuban exiles. They're trained in, um, uh, it was either Honduras or Guatemala, I think, I think Honduras. Um, and so when Kennedy becomes president, he has to, he inherits this plan. I'm not putting the onus on Eisenhower. Kennedy, having committed himself in 1960 to regime change in Cuba, uh, eventually gives it the green light. He does make some changes. Eisenhower is going to criticize him later. Eisenhower says his plan would have worked. Kennedy's was too restrictive. Uh, Kennedy changes the landing site. Under Eisenhower, it was a more remote location. Uh, under Kennedy, excuse me, under Eisenhower, it was a more public location. But Kennedy changes it to a more remote location that unfortunately is surrounded by swamps, which, and I'm not a military tactician, but to try to get off a beach when you're under fire through swamps is kind of problematic. And so he makes some changes that didn't help, 
Uh, at a certain point when these exiles are landed, and by the way, the Cubans knew they were coming. <laughs> they had penetrated this training facility. Uh, the, the men are immediately bogged down. We're talking 1,400 exiles. Bogged down for about 72 hours, getting hammered. And Kennedy is then presented with, Mr. President, you need to intervene. We need to intervene. So there's an American aircraft carrier literally visible on the horizon, bristling with aircraft that could have made short work of the Castro forces surrounding them, but he says no. He doesn't want to escalate the situation. His whole idea was this thing had to be covert. The American involvement had to be limited, had to be not visible. And he says no. And by the way, this is going to play into this notion that somehow Dallas was a result of the betrayal of the Cubans in April of 61. Amazingly, he takes full responsibility for it, but the amazing thing is his poll numbers skyrocket. <laughs> um, I think because he came out and said, it's on me. And I think the American people respected that. Plus, we were a more unified nation then. Um, particularly when it came to foreign policy and communism. So the tendency was to rally around the flag, rally around the commander in chief. Uh, but when he sees his poll numbers go up after this fiasco, he says to, to one of his aides, it's just like Eisenhower, the worse I do, the more popular I get. Uh, but he, he was rocked by this thing, you know, rightly so, he should have been. Uh, he goes to great lengths. He and Robert Kennedy go to great lengths to get these 1,400 men, who sur the, those who survived, who were being held in Castro's prisons. They finally get these people out in 62. And Kennedy delivers a speech in front of these freed exiles at the Orange Bowl in Miami. And he promises that one day, he's got the Bay of Pigs unit had their own flag. He points to the flag, he says, one day this flag will fly in a free Havana. And everybody at the time was like, what's he talking about? Well, what he was talking about was mongoose. Um, there's indications towards the end of his life that he was starting to think that this effort to topple Castro was out of all proportion, but it was still ongoing when he was killed. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, Paul, I'll get to you yeah. next. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, uh, this is sort of a, a off the topic. Do you think Putin will use uh, nuclear weapons? Oh, God. I, trying to predict Putin's behavior is, I mean, if I had to guess, I'd say no. But, You know, there are indications that his, perhaps his grip on power may be loosening. You never know when somebody's feeling cornered. I certainly hope not, but I don't know, sir. Um, I'm not sure of the lessons. People are drawing lessons. Peggy Noonan did it recently between Kennedy's handling of the missile crisis and what's going on there. Uh, but again, I, I think even to this day, a lot of Americans don't realize just how many concessions Kennedy made to lower the temperature there. I don't know if Biden or Trump or any American president could make those kinds of concessions without a domestic firestorm here at home. I really don't know, sir. Sorry. Yeah, Paul. So, Chief, I comment that you kind of slipped in, and I don't remember exactly, but you said something like Life Magazine was responsible yeah, for yeah. Captain Kennedy's yeah. image. Oh, sure. So in their day, Life and Look Magazine were sort of, you know, the, I mean, well, obviously no internet, three networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, limited news coverage. The first time the networks went to a half hour of national news was in uh, 1963. Um, so most Americans got their news through print. <clears throat> Kennedy, by the way, was an avid reader of any newspaper and magazine he could get his hand on, hands on. But Kennedy also understood, and his father was very uh, acutely tuned into the importance of, of public relations. Kennedy understood that he and his attractive wife and his beautiful young kids were, you know, 
political uh, goals. And a lot of times when Mrs. Kennedy was away, he'd call the Life or Look magazine photographers in to snap those photos. We can all picture John F. Kennedy Jr. sticking his head out of the desk with his father sitting in his desk. John and Caroline dancing in the Oval Office. That's all Life and Look magazine. And it was, uh, I don't think Mrs. Kennedy was too pleased with using, the, in her view, using the kids that way, but Kennedy understood the power of those images. Do not underestimate, I mean, he was so good on, t and then, so that's print, Life and Look sort of chronic, you know, pictures of Kennedy at Hyannisport sailing or playing touch football. When the guy was lucky to be alive, by the way, his health was, he's one of the sickest presidents we've ever had, but you'd never know. And by the way, I think this is a positive attribute. He never complained, but he was lucky to be alive. He'd been given the last rites of the church three times prior to becoming president. So he had Addison's disease. He had a serious back problem that seemed to be immune to any cure. He had almost every illness under the sun. But he projected this image of a young, vigorous, youthful president. And life and look were a big part of this. The other part, he is the first president to use, uh, to hold televised press conferences that are live. Eisenhower had some press conferences, but they were taped. And the White House retained the right to cut stuff out where I might have slipped up. Kennedy rolled the dice and stepped out in front of the microphone, in front of the cameras, live. And it became a hit. I mean, um, in 1961, they estimate 90-something uh, million Americans saw at least one of his press conferences. Because they liked, he was, he was quick, smart, and he was funny. And the, the media guys loved him. He was sort of part of their generation. Um, he made their jobs easier because he was attractive. Uh, so he uses television to project this really competent image. And it takes hold so much. The, some of you who are older, the Dick Van Dyke show, that's modeled. Dick Van Dyke is JFK and Mary Tyler Moore is Jackie. The hairstyles, the suits, everything. That, that was, they were sort of the cultural, you know, uh, they set the cultural standards, popular culture standards of the day. They were the influencers of their day. Uh, and coming after the stodgy, somewhat elderly, you know, younger than I am right now, Eisenhower's, uh, the contrast w was startling. So John F. Kennedy uses print and TV to really Break, put himself into our living rooms. And when he's killed, um, two-thirds of the American public will say that they voted for him. Right after he's killed, they do a poll. He never even got 50%. But in that two years and 10 months and two days, he had sort of, uh, you know, literally put himself in our living rooms. And one last thing, it's Mrs. Kennedy who orchestrates that funeral she tells them she wants the same cataphylact that was used for Lincoln. She wants the same black, well, the horse was long dead, but a black horse with the boots backwards in the stirrups. Uh, she wants the eternal flame at Arlington. She coaches John Jr. to salute his dead father's uh, coffin outside St. Matthew's Cathedral. She, despite the shock of having been, you know, literally right next to this murder, um, she orchestrates that whole thing. So from the beginning to the end, the literal end of the Kennedy presidency, it was a media spectacle. And those of us of a certain age will never forget it. How about one more question, if there is one? Um, yes, ma'am. You know, I just have a, a little story that you might be interested in. Uh, my older brother was um, the first psychiatrist in the Peace Corps, so he worked with Sergeant Charles quite a bit. Yeah. And he was in the White House during that whole um, process, and he arranged 
East Room of the White House. Mm -hmm. And um, but he went up to see Mrs. Kennedy because they needed a mass part done. And um, when he got off the elevator, little John John was running around and saying, uh, "Somebody shot my dad." It, it, he just he was yeah. afraid. He didn't right. understand. Right. So he went and he sat down <coughs> with Mrs. Kennedy, and she was the one who just went through the Bible and just chose what she wanted yep. on that mass card. Yep. And he said, the tears just came down, but she was determined yep. to do everything. And it was quite amazing. Yeah, the strength she, she so showed throughout that entire episode is almost superhuman. Um, you know, it's amazing that she was even there because more often than not, she did not go. This was a domestic political trip to Texas. She tended not to go on these. She didn't enjoy them particularly, but she was there, which is really kind of remarkable. Uh, but yeah, she kept herself together. Even two weeks later, she's the one who calls in uh, Theodore White, who was sort of the, I don't know, the Bob Woodward of his day or whatever. And she's the one who plants the Camelot seed. She says that President Kennedy, the two of them at night, they would listen to the Lerner and Lowe Broadway musical Camelot, which was a big deal at the time, and he loved that one particular song. You know, once there was a brief shining moment known as Camelot, or whatever. She's the one who plants that seed with Theodore White for Life magazine. And within two weeks, Camelot has, has taken hold. And that's, that's entirely, entirely on Jackie Kennedy. I used to work at the Kennedy Library, I didn't, uh, and that opened in 1979. She would show up maybe th three or four times a year. This is after all the stories, most of the story, many of the stories were out. Uh, she still kept an eye on that place. I remember one time we put a, one of my bosses decided it would be nice. You know that big pavilion, the glass in area? It was supposed to be empty. You're supposed to just sort of be alone with your thoughts. There's one inscription on the wall from his inaugural address. That was it. Somebody at the library decided it was a little too sparse. So they had this bust of President Kennedy that was about this high. They put it right underneath that inscription that's on the wall. As soon as she found out, I'll uh, never, it wasn't, I wasn't high enough to be, but the director was told in no uncertain terms, get that thing out of there. I don't want you tarting up. That was the phrase, tarting up the pavilion. Mm -hmm. So that would have been, you know, 1981, 82, 83. She kept, she still kept her eyes on that place and made sure that things were done the way she wanted. She selected the architect, I am Pei, who was a relatively unknown would go on to be a major international architect, but that was her choice. She's the one who makes it possible for the Ernest Hemingway archives to be located at the Kennedy Library because her husband had helped get Hemingway's papers out of Cuba when Castro came to power. Heming Hemingway used to vacation in Cuba in the 50s. Um, she, you know, she, right to the end, she kept her fingers on the pulse of that place, and now Caroline Kennedy does something into the same. Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm not pushing the book. I get like 10 cents per book, but there are some order forms in the back if you, if you wish. I get more than 10 cents. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for coming, everybody. And thank you to the Westwood Media Center for filming us tonight. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks.